You know, two kinds of questions embedded here that don't, it's hard for me to answer either, either of these directly, right? One is that I think that there is an empirical question to be asked about how in and since the 1980s, free trade regimes became regimes to facilitate pharmaceutical monopoly interests, right? As in there is nothing self-evident about the logic or practice of free trade per se that it should be concerned even with intellectual property, right? So there's a certain kind of conjunctural historical moment where certain industries and pharma was at the forefront, but also the entertainment industry concerns about copyright and so on, where there was a push to and, and a lobbying of, and I would say a state capture of um, the US government such that you know it it really pushed the u.s government and u.s trade representatives across administrations what happens with this administration is an open question but across administrations to really push trade regimes in the interest of corporate monopoly right um and so I think that, that there's a question that you're asking here about how, I mean, the conceptual question here is how do corporate interests act as class interests um, through lobbying the state, especially the American state, though, though the question of Europe becomes interesting as well in different kinds of ways, right? because here Europe is not one entity, it's both national state governments and the European Commission. Um, and, and, and so how, and, and it's the EC that's often, the EU that's often engaging in, in, in trade agreements, right? Um, but, uh, but the question of, of how pharmaceutical interests act as class interests in order to mobilize certain policy positions in their favor that then operate transnationally, right? I.e. what one sees are entities that individually might be competing with each other, coming together to act in concert, as many industries, industry lobbies do, right? to, to push certain kinds of state positions that become transnational government positions. Um, in the process of which something like public interest becomes scripted as antithetical to a certain kind of pharmaceutical interest that in the question of access to medicines gets phrased and recorded as innovation, right? So when one has a sort of public interest based mobilization against monopolistic property regimes, for instance, right, the big pharma response will be India is against innovation, right, which at all sorts of levels involves empirical slippage, right? India is not against innovation. The Indian government is often supporting big pharma at the expense of its citizens, right? Um, innovation, well, what does innovation mean in this context and so on and so forth, right? So there's, there's a whole series of ways in which, um, in which a certain kind of idea of public interest is scripted against corporate interest, but corporate interest is never discursively framed as corporate interest, it's framed as another kind of public interest. In this case, you know, the, the very condition of possibility of innovation being, you know, give us give us the, the global markets that we want and then we will have the incentive to innovate. Yeah. What that has to do then with the question of 
as you frame it, public trust is a complicated question, right? Because the question then becomes what public, which publics. And in a country like India, for instance, there's now a long history of political mobilization against monopolistic intellectual property regimes because this became highly politicized from the get-go, from the late 1980s. Right? And a lot of people were politicized around it. So there was a lot of political knowledge around something that was quite an esoteric technical matter, right? And left political parties had an especially important role along with various kinds of civil society groups and so on. So a lot of knowledge was generated. Um, it's not often easy to, you know, like that's a historically contingent thing as well. And again, it was a function also of of the fact that Indian industry actors were interested parties and, you know, formed these alliances and themselves were mobilizing against certain kinds of... It also had to do with the fact that there was a farmers' movement at that time that was mobilizing against GATT because there were issues of agricultural subsidies involved, right? So it became a kind of broad-based coalition where many kind of both industrial and public interests were, were mobilizing to create a, a discourse of, if you like, suspicion, mistrust of, in other words, to create a discourse that never really allowed pharma to get away with their reframing of corporate interest as simply innovation. But that doesn't happen in many parts of the world and it's hard for it to happen in many parts of the world because intellectual property is an esoteric, is an esoteric matter, right? So, for instance, one part of the research that I was doing in following the patent disputes around this drug Gleevec took me to South Korea, where there was a very lively politics around Gleevec and leukemia patient groups were mobilizing to, um, to you know, press the government to issue a compulsory license on the drug. And, uh, but intellectual property was already a closed issue because the Korean government had signed an IP agreement with the US in 1986 at the height of the pro-democracy movements in South Korea, where a whole series of other things, including the nature of geopolitical relations, were very much being contested, but not around intellectual property, right? Like that was just an esoteric issue. That, so, so there is something about particular national civil societies and its articulation with a global civil society that emerged very strongly, especially in the 1990s, and especially around issues like the AIDS crisis and access to medications in the AIDS crisis, right? That, that create and sustain a discourse of suspicion of big pharma interests. And there are organizations and institutions that have been really important in generating sustained empirical evidence that consistently denaturalizes and reveals the myth of innovation as operating in corporate interest. But that travels in certain circles, right? It doesn't, you know, there's, there's a huge, you know, public discourse around the issue of drug pricing in the US, for instance, but it's not necessarily in public discourse attached to global free trade. Look, this is this is complicated. So let me let me tell you about the work of a couple of other people, right? Through which I can think this. One concerns the the history of evidence based medicine um, writ large in the U.S. is an important part of this history, right? Because a lot of this emerges out of the U.S. But writ large, um, especially from the 1930s onwards. And this is, you know, here I'd refer you to Harry Marx's book, The Progress of Experiment, which is, which is the sort of historical account of this, right? Where, um, and, and he talks about the emergence of evidence-based medicine in the context of a New Deal politics, right? Where one of the things that is really at stake is um, the, um, the regulation of quackery, right? And of quack medication, quack medicaments, and, and, and all of which have um, public safety implications, right? Um, 
there and 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 this is the establishment of the USFDA and and a whole sort of regulatory infrastructure that in various ways over the subsequent 80 years comes to be compromised but still remains more robust than many other regulatory infrastructures for drug safety in many other parts of the world right um, still often seen as a gold standard for instance so um, so so you have that history and one of the interesting questions about that history is that the FDA which emerges as an institution to regulate the safety and efficacy of drugs, the investment in safety really is what it's about rather than the investment in efficacy, right? Um, and, and that has certain consequences and not, not good or bad in any simple sense, but it's consequential for the kind of regulatory agency that it becomes. Right? So that's one kind of story. And, and within the trajectory of this story, um, of course, evidence-based medicine is vital, right? It's important, I think, I think a world with evidence-based medicine is better than a world without, right? Um, and, and alongside this story, one must also then take into account the role of evidence-based medicine, not just in, um, in um, pharmaceutical clinical trials to test safety and efficacy of drugs, but also in the development of public health and outcomes-based research, right? And this is Stefan Timmermans and Mark's, Mark Berg's work, The Gold Standard, where they trace this history of evidence-based medicine. And especially in things like, you know, through the 1950s and so on, something like uh, establishing the public health risks of smoking, for instance, right? Um, evidence-based medicine becomes very important. And one modality of evidence-based medicine towards public health, and this is, if you like, the biopolitical and welfare state function of evidence-based medicine, right? Um, not just safety, but also increasing well-being, um, is through the emergence of these large-scale, long-term, longitudinal studies. And something like the Framingham Heart Study is the classic example of this. And these become very... So that's one. But the second thing I want to throw into this then is, is Joe Dumit's story, right? And Joe Dumit, um, whose book Drugs for Life published in 2012 is a must read for anyone who's interested in this, right? Dumit's question is a very simple one which has to do with what he calls prescription maximization, right? As in, why is it that in the US prescription rates only grow with no signs of stopping? And why is it that the US is the most therapeutically saturated country in the world, right? Um, in ways that in fact don't necessarily have to do with healthiness, in ways that are in fact um, quite toxic, right? And the instantiation of this in the opioid crisis is just one manifestation of this. But one sees this, you know, I mean, I mean, this is part of the politics of psychopharmaceuticals, for instance, and so on and so forth, right? And there you get an interesting other set of potential formulations that, you know, that I can't describe in detail here. But on the one hand, there's something like David Healy's work, where he's actually looking at pharmaceutical clinical trials for antidepressants and isn't suggesting fraud in any simple way, but is suggesting all the ways that biases are built into the, the structure of these studies such that they privilege uh, maximal prescription, right? But, but, the, but the thing that Joe does that's, that's so stunning, and I think the Foucauldians really get a fit when they, when they hear this more than anyone else, right? The industry people get it absolutely. They're like, yeah, this is the Foucauldians. How is this possible? Is that one of the conditions of possibility for prescription maximization is precisely the large scale longitudinal public health study that creates the population as a certain kind of aggregate that can become the statistical basis for justifying further prescription to individuals. Right? i.e. the question becomes not the question of the fraudulent clinical trial, 
but rather the question of what kinds of questions are asked in clinical trials or clinical research in the first place, which are invariably always questions about, does this make sense to get on medication? Never a question about, when is it okay to stop, right? Except in oncology, which is a complicated thing, and that raises a whole different set of questions. But there's something in the design of the way in which questions are asked that already privileges a pharmaceuticalized regime as now scientifically valid because evidence-based medicine has told you so, right? But what is, and, and, and so the question here is not a question of, it's not the way in which the question emerges in the anti-vaccine thing, which is simply anti-science, right? And that's problematic in all sorts of ways. The question is not science versus anti-science. And whenever I talk in the US, there's always one person in the audience who hears my work and says, see, that proves the anti-vaccine people. And that's, that's just not where this is going, right? It's, it's not doubting the legitimacy of science. It's asking the question of what kinds of foundational questions are being answered rigorously through scientific practice and who has the agenda in setting the questions in the first place.